Ian Fletcher from the NHS, and he I'll let him introduce himself in details, but but in general, he's got oversight for cybersecurity for all of the trusts across the Southwest, which is a interesting challenge. Um, and he'll be talking about what the NHS is up to. Um, and then we're gonna be followed by uh, Jan Yaviskovic, um, who's gonna be talking about the combinatory issues of uh, cyber resilience and individual burnout and how these things come together and need to be addressed. So uh, yeah, over to you, Ian. Excellent. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, let me just put that in PowerPoint. Yep. Which should have worked. Is that okay? Yep. Excellent. Right. Okay. Uh, so. Yeah, lo lovely to uh, to sort of hear everyone and give their introductions. I I don't think I've formally been to to one of these events, so really delighted to be here. Hopefully, I'll be a regular attender from now on. Um, but so my intention for the the this presentation is just to give you uh, firstly an intro into myself, but then more about um, what the NHS does, uh, and in particular um, what we're doing around protecting NHS organizations and ultimately parents, um, uh, pa patients from, from suffering uh, cyber attack. There may be some uh, good practice in there that, that you want to, to think about, but really this is just a, a general intro into to what the NHS is doing and that, that wider understanding. So uh, first of all, I'll tell you a bit about my, myself. Uh, those that are Stu among Stu in that picture may notice that I'm wearing scout uniform um, and NECA there. Um, I'm actually a group scout leader and explorer leader for Sid Vale. That's obviously my spare time. Um, my formative career was spent in the Royal Navy, uh, serving on various ships and uh, as an environmental specialist, but ending up in geospatial intelligent roles which is probably where my interest in security stems from, um, you know, trying to deal with large sensitive data sets. I then joined Devon and Cornwall Police as their information assurance manager and lastly head of information management. Um, and it was after five years in that role that this new position in what was NHS digital uh, came available. Um, basically, uh, the role materialized after Will Smart's report um, after the WannaCry incident back in 2017. Um, uh, in that recommendation, it was identified that after WannaCry, um, really NHS organizations didn't have anyone on the ground uh, to uh, ask support from. Uh, there was no one uh, feeding back to the center around cybersecurity. So it's basically a, a, a big gap. Um, as a result, seven roles were created um, regional uh, security roles uh, and that's when I started back in 2019. It's probably just worth spending a few moments explaining a bit about NHS England, uh, although if I was to do it full justice I think it would probably take most of the day because it is so complex and I'm still trying to understand it myself. Um, but confusing matters further is that my former employee, NHS Digital, has now merged with NHS England. So we're one big happy family uh, in that sense. Um, however, I think it's still worth explaining uh, what NHS Digital as was uh, does um, because I think it puts my role uh, into context. So uh, with that in mind, um, as I said, in NHS England is the national digital data and technology delivery partner for the NHS and social care system uh, with expertise in the design, development and operation of complex IT and data systems. Specifically, that includes building core IT data infrastructure, platforms, life services on which the NHS and social care systems rely. Um, it provides a center of excellence uh, in cybersecurity, offering deep technical expertise uh, and national services to help organizations across the NHS defend their systems from digital threat. It offers 
data services that transform care uh, and support groundbreaking life science research. This includes the, the collection, the connection, and dissem dissemination of some of the world's most valuable health data sets and the, uh, the primary provider of official statistics and analysis to the system. So it plays an important part in improving uh, the efficiency and quality of frontline services. It protects people's private information, acting as the data custodian for England's health and care system, um, and uh, insisting on the, the sort of highest standards of privacy, transparency, and information governance across all of the NHS services. Um, I think, however, though, it's it, the most important thing uh, to sort of realize is that it maintains the viability, performance, and security of the core infrastructure, platforms, and live services uh, that the NHS and social care system rely. So that was a bit of a sales pitch in terms of what NHS England um, and formerly digital does. Um, but now I want to focus obviously a bit more on the, the cyber perspective and, and cyber operations within, within the NHS. So there's two key areas I think that I, I want to sort of uh, expand on within the NHS uh, in terms of cyber uh, from a central perspective. First, we have the National um, Cyber Information Security Officer, the CISO, Phil Huggins, who is responsible for managing the overall system cyber risk. Uh, his team, the Joint Cyber Unit, are responsible for setting out the strategy, which I'll talk a bit more about, um, developing policy. Um, they're also the regulators. So if you imagine uh, the um, Information Commissioner's Office um, is a regulator, NHS England, um, is the delegated regulator as well for NIS uh, regulations. On the other side, uh, you have the executive director for cyber operations, Mike Fell, um, is responsible um, for internal looking. Uh, so we mentioned all those uh, services that the NHS do. Um, Mike's responsible for uh, the security of those. Uh, he's also responsible for the cybersecurity operating center. Um, and the main role uh, of, of that area, cyber operations, is not only to, to look internally, but also ensure that local organisations are able to uh, support themselves, prep themselves with regard to cyber security. And I, and I actually uh, sit under cyber operations under, under Mike. So my role in all that, um, so I'm a, a cyber SME, so I... Uh, advise and guide organizations with regard to cyber maturity and cyber resilience. I'm um, there uh, letting them know, promoting uh, any cyber services that are coming from a central perspective, also um, advising them on the strategy and the policy that's coming from, from the center. Um, but also, really importantly, is because I'm talking to local organizations, understanding their, their, their problems, their, their cyber issues, I feed that back to the center. So in terms of policy strategy, we're very influential in terms of shaping, shaping what that looks like. So why is cyber security so important to the NHS? Uh, I think, well, we probably obviously all know this, but I, I think it's worth just highlighting a, a few things. So nation state actors are interested in, in how governments manage its society, how it operates, how it, you know, its civic norms. Um, cyber warfare involves disrupting key government departments and matters of state. And as a critical national infrastructure, um, the NHS is therefore of huge interest. Um, you, in, uh, you affect, interrupt the N operations of the NHS, you're affecting basically uh, the UK. I've just mentioned that we hold some of the most valuable health data sets in the world, worth millions, if not billions, to research pharmaceutical companies. And therefore, these are really rich pickings for criminal organisations. And because of the sheer size of the healthcare industry, our attack surface is naturally large. The NHS has some 80,000 different suppliers. And so, as you can imagine, trying to manage that is really, really difficult. And I've mentioned how NHS England is trying to constantly evolve its technology to make patient services better, more consumable, more efficient. This involves lots 
of innovative technologies such as AI. Um, this makes security in our, our world really challenging as it's often untried, untested technologies that are being used and that we have to, to work with. The impact of cyber incident can be far reaching and we're probably all aware of the recent ones. If I just take advanced as an example, um, they, you know, within a single organization, they provided services uh, from, you know, uh, clinical services, 111, um, uh, HR, I think the commercial as well, they, they provide mental health um, services. So for a local organization, it was, it was really impactful. What we had though was advanced was effect, um, uh, supporting the whole of the NHS, you know, it had huge uh, coverage. Therefore, taking advanced uh, with a ransomware affected uh, pretty much all of the NHS. So it was a huge, huge impact. Alternatively, if we look very locally at the incident um, from a local perspective, the impact um, can affect critical care. You know, it can take out, uh, if we do have a, a, um, a cyber incident, uh, you know, a critical clinical um, uh, equipment, um, sensitive data, personal data can become at risk from being exposed. Um, we've also seen millions of pounds lost through for fraud. Uh, and this can be using simple attack techniques from phishing, but um, you know it, it's an ongoing problem that we're having to deal with on a daily basis. Uh, and then there's obviously the reputational damage, which is often intangible. But when um, you know we have a major breach, patients start losing their trust in health providers. They're perhaps reluctant to give their medical details. Um, that can obviously have in wider impacts on research. Um, uh, uh, etc. So um, whilst I imagine there are many common challenges affecting all the organisations uh, that you represent, I think the sheer scale and complexity of the NHS compounds what can potentially be manageable problems into sort of Mount Everest style, style challenges. So I've highlighted uh, some of these here. Uh, we've all seen the pressures the NHS up, uh, is under in terms of waiting list times, the queues of ambulances at ED entrances. Uh, but any interruption to 24-hour services and the systems that support them is really difficult to factor in. So something like simply uh, patching schedules to keep systems up to date or responding to critical uh, zero-day vulnerabilities is actually really difficult to achieve for an NHS organisation. I mentioned the complexity of the NHS. Um, every, every trust, every hospital operates slightly differently. So one size definitely does not fit all. Uh, so that becomes really difficult if we're, we're talking policy, um, uh, architectural designs, et cetera. Um, and we all know cyber specialism is in short supply, um, but as the NHS is, is the fifth largest employer in the world, that shortage becomes really quite acute. Um, I've, uh, I've previously talked about how we constantly strive to be innovative with our technology um, and the large number of supply chain uh, suppliers that we've got. But legacy technology is also conversely a, a problem. We may be looking at future protracted procurement, very bespoke and expensive equipment such as MRI scanners, CT scanners that are in the hundreds of thousands of pounds and, and the general lack of money that the NHS has mean that hospitals will be operating very old machines, often old operating systems that can't be upgraded. Um, you know, they are really sweating the asset in that sense. And sometimes it's not always clear who is responsible for what. Um, is it the trust that's responsible for security? Is it NHS England, the centre, or is it the supplier? And this means that security can often feel, uh, fall between, between the gaps. So as you can imagine, a, a huge problem the NHS faces. So, uh, you know, what are we doing about, uh, about it? What, how are we trying to manage this very complex area? Well, um, one of the things we, we, we've done in, in March this year, we published our health and social care strategy out till 2030. 
and it was uh, it, it was really well received. It, it helped outline what we were trying to achieve and the way in which we were trying to achieve it. It's helped local organisations and integrated care systems understand better what is required of them so that they can align their own strategies uh, with the central direction. The strategy is made up of five pillars and I'll just quickly run, run through them. Um, pillar one is about identifying and then focusing on the greatest risk and harms. Um, I talked, uh, the NHS is, is a, um, a provider of an essential service, so it comes under CPNI um, and the NIS regulations. Uh, and therefore, it's really important that we understand various parts of the health system and patient services that will cause the most harm if they were, in, uh, they were disrupted. Um, and this will help us focus on what really matters, making the most of our limited resources, ensuring the maximum effectiveness on any cyber investment that we do get. Pillar two um, looks at how to leverage NSA, NHS capability, the technologies and scale in a way in which we can also improve the cyber resilience um, uh, of, of our wider sector. So health and social care, we've got to be better integrated in its overall approach with stronger direction from national teams and centralized platforms. But organizations must in parallel um, be allowed greater autonomy in deciding how they implement strategic direction, standards and services uh, according to the need. I previously mentioned there is no one size uh, fitting all. Um, I think this principle can and should be applied uh, at, at all levels really. So you've got the organizational level where departments need to be working together um, understanding their cyber risk, being cyber champions for their area. Um, all staff should be uh, working to, together to reduce the risk. Then at the next level, the integrated care system level, those organisations within that providing those services should be collaborating more, understanding um, where common risks are, um, sharing good practice. And then obviously we've got our national level uh, where we should be setting common goals. In order to manage cyber risk, we need to work effectively together as a team, ensuring that all cyber staff are equipped and the relevant skills to address cyber threats, which is what people and culture pillar looks to address. Um, we need to substantially increase the numbers and expertise of cyber professionals working at the national, regional and local levels. Appreciate this is a long-term challenge uh, and we're gonna start with the hiring and the training programs, forging cyber career pathways, working with academia, and presenting the health and social care as a rewarding place for, uh, to pursue a career in cyber. It's also important that we must offer relevant cyber basic training to the general health and social care workforce, uh, as well as board uh, and senior information. Uh, risk owners. I talked earlier about the sheer scale of our supply chain and pillar four looks to address this through designing the future sector with security in mind. From a national perspective we will commit to working more closely with suppliers so that we understand the most critical parts of our supply chain uh, and make our expectations of those providers much clearer. Um, we're also setting standards so that expectations across the sector are more consistent of our suppliers. At, at the moment, a single supplier to a hospital will have to fill out a different standard based on the specific hospital wants. So, you know, this can cause inconsistencies and confu confusion. Uh, and I know talking to manufacturers, it's a real bugbear. In today's and tomorrow's threat environment, um, we know it's a case of when and if not, if we suffer a cyber attack. Um, I've already mentioned our attack surface and, and the size of it, and we're seeing incidents, actual and near misses uh, on a daily basis. So we really need to be in the best position to respond and, re uh, and recover. And it's all about preparing. Um, one of my specific roles is to help organizations and integrated care systems run instant response exercises. Uh, but it's also about ensuring good communication, making sure the right people and teams know when and how to respond. Um, it's about doing good backups, 
uh, that are tested, business continuity plans are well known, accessible, fit for purpose, etc. Um, we are seeing increasing cases of data exfiltration, uh, so it's also key to work, we need to work together um, on, on how to manage this, noting that it can cause quite considerable stress to individuals who may already be vulnerable. Um, it's also worth highlighting the just culture we're increasingly embedding across the system. The important thing in the event of an instance, once we've recovered from it, is to learn and deliver improvements, not to point, point the blame. So um, what are we doing uh, and what do we have in place at the moment? Um, so we're very proud of, of what we've achieved uh, over the last couple of years. Um, one of the biggest protections we have across the system is the deployment of Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, MDE, to just under 1.5 million devices and servers uh, across the system. This provides telemetry data back to the central team, the CSOC, who can monitor the whole of the NHS estate, um, identifying uh, where vulnerabilities are uh, and if in, uh, any nefarious scripts or traffic are being initiated. They can provide system-wide blocks, system-wide searches, provide uh, just that overarching security blanket to our NHS. We've also established a national alerting system, which organizations are mandated to respond to. But there's quite an involved process uh, before we issue an alert, a high severity alert. Um, it will have to meet several thresholds before it is issued. Um, and the reason we, we go through those thresholds because on issuing it, organizations will have to not only acknowledge the alert within 48 hours, but then remediate within 14 days. And as I've mentioned, uh, how difficult this can be for some organizations, particularly if it is a, a critical live service. We have our data security protection toolkit, which provides a baseline standard for all NHS organizations. Um, and where they are meeting the standard or not meeting the standard, they will have to provide improvement plans which get reviewed uh, and evidence how they will make, meet the standard by a set time. A lot of investment goes into providing central services that will help organizations with their cyber security and resilience, um, be it a monitoring tool uh, or a consultancy service to help identify where improvements can be made. And finally, we have the Cyber Associates Network, um, similar to the Southwest Cluster, but on a much, much larger scale. Um, and it's where people can ask questions and get help and advice from their peers, drawing on the considerable expertise across the NHS. And it is a real, really active, um, active community. So yes, um, we still get attacked, um, but considering where we have come from, um, five years ago. I think we're very proud to have achieved so much in a relatively short space of time. There's still a long way to go, um, but we have a strategy uh, and we have a plan. Um, and we've also got a, a lot of dedicated and committed team uh, who are constantly striving to, to make the NHS a, a better and secure place. So that was my quick run through of what we're doing in terms of uh, the NHS. Um, I guess it's open to, to any questions.